Star Trek is back with the premiere of Lower Deck Season 3, and I've got creator showrunner Mike McMahon and Don Lewis in the ready room to discuss. But first, since I interviewed Mike and Don, the Star Trek family and Star Trek community lost one of our brightest stars. And before we report to the ready room, I want to take a moment to honor and remember Nichelle Nichols. In the role of Lieutenant Uhura, Nichelle not only helped establish Star Trek as an optimistic vision of what could be, but also inspired generations of black performers, scientists, and leaders in all fields through her on-screen representation. On behalf of all of us in the Star Trek family, we in the Ready Room celebrate her not only for her contributions to our beloved Star Trek universe, but especially for her influence on the world we currently live in. On a personal level, from the moment we met her in 1987, Nichelle was one of the original series cast members who welcomed all of us on The Next Generation into the Star Trek family with open arms. She wasn't just nice, she was kind. She didn't have to be, but she was. I never got to spend much time with her, but whenever I was around her, she was such a lovely human. Always joyful and never more than a couple of seconds away from a song. She brightened every room she was in, and it is such a privilege to be a very, very small part of her legacy. Please join me in a moment of silence and reflection. May her memory be a blessing. Thank you. Let's get started. Hey nerds, I'm Will Wheaton, and this is The Ready Room, your official behind-the-scenes hub for all things Star Trek Universe. Here we are, back in action, reporting for duty after a luxurious few weeks of shore leave. Season 3 of Star Trek Lower Decks is here, and I can't wait to dive into the hilariously nerdy ways this was a perfect first episode. But first, considering we're diving into an all-new season, picking up after a season two cliffhanger, I would be remiss if I did not declare a red alert! If you haven't watched the season three premiere Grounded, you're going to want to ground yourself to the couch, stream it first, and then report for duty to the ready room. We'll be going maximum warp to the spoiler zone, and you do not want to be caught unawares. So we're picking up after last season's cliffhanger with Captain Freeman arrested for the attack on pac Planet, which is why we had to invite Dawn Lewis and Mike McMahon to discuss all that played out in this first episode. I also very much need to personally know what it is going to take to make a first contact amusement theme park in Bozeman, Montana a reality. Are you listening, powers that be? I mean, worse ideas have been fully funded. Later, we'll get to hear from one of the series animators as they describe the creative process and give us a tutorial on how to draw for Lower Decks. I have had the privilege of being animated in this style, and now I get to say that I share that honor with James Cromwell. But first, of all the ways the Lower Deckers could get themselves to the Cerritos from Earth, hijacking a ride at Historic Bozeman was by far the funniest way to go. I know I'm not the only one who would go to serious extremes for a ride on the Phoenix, piloted by Hollow Zephyrin Cochran, right? Speaking of, we will take any excuse to celebrate the advent of warp travel and that historic launch. And I know the creators and Lower Decks cast members feel the same way. So here's what they had to say when we asked them about it. Control room, engage. First stage separation complete. Let's bring what I like to call the Warp Core online. I mean, James Cromwell is back. Guys, he's back. I can't believe that we actually got him to get in the booth and say the silliest things possible. I am so touched that he would come back and reprise his role in this way. Like, what a cute, cool thing. Cromwell's amazing, like any Star Trek royalty, and I can't believe we got him. Let's rock and roll. Hello, explorers, and welcome to the 21st century. 
I love 301 for all of the Bozeman stuff. I loved having a revisit of First Contact. And I love that they made it like kind of a cheesy theme park, but that you still love. It kind of reminded me of like Dollywood. The Vulcan ship is just a slide now. Like <laughs> they're like, oh, there's the ship the Vulcans landed on. And the kid's just like, wee. <laughs> the fun thing about Lower Decks is that the writers are always really playing within the Star Trek universe in a very inventive and clever and funny way. And the fact that they got Mr. Cromwell to come back and recreate his role um, as the inventor of the warp drive, I think is just absolutely brilliant. And of course the Phoenix is, is a ride now. That makes absolute sense. It warms my heart to hear him instruct everybody as to what to do and keep their hands inside the vehicle, that kind of thing. Oh. Hi, I'm just finishing up some repairs, and you should finish up any snacks. My reaction to seeing myself animated is sort of the same as seeing yourself as a plastic doll. Uh, <laughs> it's very strange. Working in animation is a blessing. I have the opportunity to do practically anything I want because you're going to be recreated. Any mistake you make can be modified by the animators, bless their hearts and it can be changed, so I feel most comfortable doing that. My character was a lot of fun. Thanks for riding with me, explorers. It's rare to have nostalgia and feel really touched because you're like, oh, I miss this thing, and to also be laughing so hard kind of at and with it. I think Mike and the writers really walked that line beautifully. The thing about First Contact is, it's just a frickin' amazing movie. Like, you could have, I, I remember seeing it with friends who had never seen Star Trek, had no context, and it's just, the Borg are an amazing threat in it. It's got comedy, it's got action, it's got time travel, it's got a Borg queen. Every movie should have a Borg queen. I don't know, I, I'm a huge fan of that movie. I could go on and on about it forever. And it's up there with the best Star Trek movies easily. It's so fun to see, you know, uh, an Earth, a pre-Starfleet Earth. And it's also really fun to see these kind of horror movie uh, aspects to the movie. I mean, everything with Picard and the Borg is kind of terrifying. I don't know, it's just got like a real homespun hero kind of energy. It's, it's an adventure. It's got all those fun, classic sci-fi elements. I think First Contact is a popular Star Trek film because it gives us a sense of beginning. Well, without First Contact, Star Trek wouldn't exist. It's really a bridging of the Trek that we know and the sort of prehistory of Trek. And you know, the, the moment that the Vulcans first arrive on Earth and, you know, everything about it is the, the sort of, um, you know, the book of Genesis of Star Trek. It had a relationship to the entirety of the series because it was first contact. It was, it was a visualization of what happened that started the whole thing from nothing to this incredible journey. Prepare to make history. Here we go. To dive into the Star Trek Lower Deck season three premiere, I can't think of anyone else I would want to talk to more than creator and showrunner Mike McMahon, and of course, the falsely accused captain of the Cerritos, <laughs> Don Lewis, <laughs> AKA Captain Freeman. Welcome. I am so happy that you are here in person. I'm thrilled to be here in person. I think it's okay. I like being online more, but as long as I'm with you guys, I'll do it in person. It's well, we nice. appreciate you uh, uh, coming all the way here to the studio. Uh, let's start out at the beginning of season three. We have Captain Freeman wrongly yes. imprisoned mm -hmm. and charged with conspiracy. Correct. And we have our lower deckers just killing themselves, trying to secure her freedom, prove that she's innocent. Why would Freeman do no this? No comment. What did you hear? I said no comment. Please. A little did respect. Did she hit ah, Get that f out of our way. And then she shows up at the end, like the entire trial happened off camera. Off camera, yeah. It's so funny, and that is so hilariously A story of her to happen. You talked yeah. about this being about the B story, so of course we don't see the A story. Well, you know, first off, we left with this big cliffhanger. Everybody's upset. Captain Freeman, Don mm -hmm. Lewis, taken away. Yeah. Mariner's especially upset. Yeah. That's her mom, that's her captain, right? Yeah. And then, in Lower Decks fashion, look, We've only got 10 episodes. They're only a half hour each. <laughs> How long are we it. not going to have the captain Let's of the ship on, right? Let's get to it. So like one full episode is a tenth of our entire season. So I felt yeah. like that would be enough. You yeah. know, like let's let's miss the captain for one whole episode and then we're going to get her back in the mix, right? Yeah. And so at the same time, 
we've seen some pretty amazing Star Trek court procedurals, right? Yes, we have. But our guys aren't important enough to be in that, the Lower Deckers. Right. So while Mariner's trying to steal the ship and she's, you know, rallying the crew, of course Captain Freeman is having a proper A story, yeah, big... Yeah, a whole measure of a man, big, like, absolute... Yes. hour-long like, prestige. the stage yes. trial. Yes. Yeah. yes. Your Honor, the courtroom is a crucible. In it, we burn away irrelevances until we are left with a pure product, the truth, for all time. When she comes swooping in, it's like... We've told you a million times that that's happening. And even her dad, you know. Trust uh, the process. Trust in Starfleet. Trust yeah. in the Starfleet process. process. Yeah. And, and okay. Mariner at the end is like, oh, you know, I, I, I may have been kirking a little too hard here, a little too fast. I love that she actually calls that out. <laughs> the kirking, you are right? not kirking. Like, oh, okay, you Kirk are is not cool. not kirking. <laughs> okay, Kirk is cool. Kirk is on point. You are just like all over the place. Mariner all over the place. is cool too, but I think Kirk maybe has a couple more. Uh, uh, Starfleet Miles under his belt too, right? He like, does. Mariner is so impetuous, yeah. though. She really is. And um, she hears you, but doesn't really hear you. You think Mariner and Ensign Kirk would share a lot of qualities? Oh, I think they'd get into some yes. real trouble. They yeah, would get into some sure, real right? trouble Do together. they like each other, or are they so similar, they're just constantly butting heads? I think they, you I know, in Starfleet, like I think you see other. the best of each other, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I really enjoyed that, that actually, just like, to be serious for a moment as a Star Trek fan, the message of Starfleet is an organization for good. Yes. Starfleet is an organization where truth matters. Starfleet is an organization where the right thing is the best thing. And of course that's what happened, right? Yeah. Of course we were supposed to trust the process. Right. Um, Dawn, tell me about the season two cliffhanger. Did you know how this was going to be resolved? You know, or did I never you spend, know. So like the rest of us, you sat around wondering what was gonna happen. No, Mike, how dare you? Mike, Mike <laughs> McMahon makes it a point to not share information um, I'm really glad they gave me the whole script okay. and not just my my pages. <laughs> Your pages yeah. yeah. No, no. Uh, we did not know how it was going to flesh out, but what we do know is that all of these specific people are are integral yeah. to the telling of the story and yeah. the journey of the story. So if he got me into a jam, I knew one way or another I was going to get out of a jam. The question was, do we see? being released from from the jam or do we trust that it's happening to get me back in the mix and what did I learn from being in the jam where where does that propel me and my crew to go next you know two parters are so hard because the first part is a blast and the second part how do you make like it just is going to end up feeling like the second half of a better episode right so it's and how do you challenge. do it without cheating the audience you yes. have to earn it yeah. You have to earn you that anticipation of yeah. the entire off season. And for us, it was like, okay, it's it's been a long time. Animation takes a long time to make, yeah. right? We wanted to do an episode that felt big. We go to a place we've never been in the show before. Right. We go to Earth. Yeah. We're, we're stealing the Cerritos. We're doing big stuff. But then on top of that, if anybody in the audience feels like, oh, they wanted a bunch of this plot across the season, yeah, the choices that Mariner makes in that episode mm -hmm. with with the captain, echoes across the season. Like, it's not like we erase it. Yes. Right, right. Yeah, which right. actually tees up my next question. Mariner and Freeman's relationship really changes. It does. In, in this episode particularly, talk about the character development uh, between, between the two of them as captain and, mm -hmm. and junior officer, and also as mother and daughter. What I love about, like, like what Mike was just saying, there are, there are so many aspects of us as humans or as beings in this show yeah. that are maintained. There's, there's still the bumping heads. There's a still the, I wish you could do some, something better and differently, but at the same time, in this coming season, you realize that there are things that we do recognize and appreciate mm -hmm. in each other. So it's not just based on we're just at odds all all the, the time. It's at odds with love yeah. and with concern yeah. and with appreciation. And I'm only saying what I'm saying because I see you and I appreciate you and I expect you to do better yeah. now that I know. And yeah. the same thing from from her. We're not always successful at it, but yeah. you know, it, we're taking baby steps. I love that relationship yeah. that exists between the two of them. Me too. Uh, it's it's um, it's really interesting to me, um, and I just I, I I having been a kid on a spaceship, uh, <laughs> uh, it's always really cool to me to see how the parent and and child, even if the child is an adult, 
right. how the parent and child relationship plays out. Yeah, it's actually very similar to my relationship with my, my mom yeah. when I was growing up. As a teenager, <laughs> my mom could just say my name and it would be like, Sure. And he was like, I was like, what, what do you want? But as you get older and you grow, you mature, you put some distance between you and then put us back together. You see each other differently and you respond to each other differently. And every now and then you hear yourself responding the way you did when you were 14 and go, yeah. Let me not do Boy, that. That's I know not that. cool. Like, wait a minute. That's I, re not I, remember, cool. I remember when I was you. So we're going to make a different choice here. And that's what I see happening with Beckett and with Freeman. Did you and Tawny get to spend any time together in the same location? Were you in the booth together at all this very season? Very early on. Oh, uh, that's uh, great. Very, in season one, we yeah. were. And then I left to work on a different gig. And then everything yeah. became remote. And you then the Broadway. pandemic, I was on Broadway. Yeah. And uh, Yeah, I mean, I'm on Broadway. This carries a bit more weight yeah. than I was doing I was a different a gig. gig. Like, I think maybe you should, uh, yeah. Yeah, listen, I'm not the boss of you, Don Lewis, but I feel like maybe lean into that a little yeah. bit. When but, I'm okay. on a different gig, I work at In-N-Out. When <laughs> she's working at In-N-Out. <laughs> totally. uh, in first season, there was this amazing moment where Don and Tani were in the booth together. It's in the episode where the ship gets terraformed, yeah. and they're stuck digging through it together, and yeah. they're arguing, and they're arguing over each other. Oh my God, why I'm do you have to second guess every choice I make? to help you, be Beckett. What, what am I supposed to do? Just, just have to be in charge. What I would prefer is really, if you would just really let me do it. me. And that's one of the few times where they're literally in the booth arguing over each other, but honestly, I could never even tell. You guys are so good. Thank that, you. Like, it's almost like you're talking to Tawny when you're performing it, even yes. when she's not in the room with you. And the thing is, that I was just saying earlier that the, we established that kind of rhythm and that communication very early on. So I'm really grateful that we got to have that, those couple of times because together. having a, a story about an adult daughter yes, and her mom is different from a kid daughter and a mom, right? Yes. Yeah. And yes. that she is an ensign in your crew because you're her boss too. Yes. And that all of that stuff mixed, the tone that you hit with her as employee and 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 subordinate to mom and boss, like I think that carried through from there on out. It's been great. And to be honest with you, when we're working, I get to hear I hear Tawny's voice. Yeah. In my yes. in in my head. Yeah. So I I get a sense, first of all, she does doesn't breathe. Uh, it's like <laughs> That's one, not true. I've seen her breathe. One long run on sense. It's like, how do you say all of what you say in one breath? It's in in I just stand there like Captain Freeman, come on, let's be nice. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but, but literally, when I'm in the booth working on it now, whether she's with me or not, yeah. I really do hear her voice and her cadence in my in, in my ear. Yeah. And I've asked her about that. She says, Dawn, I feel the same way. I was like, yeah. I know, I hear it in my head, how yeah. you would deliver this line. And, and it causes us to bring this energy to it. And then the mastery of the editors that we work with and the and the voice directors because yeah. they hear our characters in their heads as well. They hear Eugene, they hear Noel, they hear Jack, and they know our cadences now and they direct us accordingly. And and when they bring it all together, it really is remarkable. You would really think that we're all in the room together. It's really, really great. I can hear Jerry O'Connell right now. Like, as, yeah. as can I. He says we're doing yes. great. We're he's, he's like, <laughs> um, this episode brings in uh, James Cromwell. All right, buckos, prepare for your trek amongst the stars. Oh, I, I mean, love him. come on. The king. So, like, I love you bring in James Cromwell to be Zephram Cochran. Yep. So many amazing, just sublime first contact references. <laughs> yes. Having Mr. Cromwell in there, it's like, not only is it having James Cromwell, but it's also having Zephyrin Cochran. Like, yes. that's kind of a big deal. Crazy. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's pedigree from TOS, it's pedigree from First Contact, and it's kind of that amazing Enterprise episode where they did the alt history opening, yeah. you know, where, where it goes wrong, right? Like, we finally get to be in on that party, too, and having Cromwell in there is just, it's such a silly carnival version of Bozeman that it adds this like layer of legitimacy that we don't deserve. It's so funny and fun. <laughs> I actually really love, I have, I, I have publicly said, I feel like Lower Decks is a love letter to Next Generation and the Next Generation yes. universe. Yeah. Deep Space Nine, Enterprise, Voyager, yeah. like it's, right. it is a love letter to that part of Star Trek, right? 
and I think about the moments where I feel like that love letter just jumps up and yeah. and and say does the say anything boombox yeah. is in moments like this where we see these things that yeah, of course there would be an amusement park in Bozeman. Sure. Right. And of right. course it would be a tacky, touristy right. thing. We yes. just take it for granted. Like, I mean, it's Gatorland, right? Yeah, but in, I think but it's in like, the future. It's, I mean, it's post-scarcity future. Nobody's buying anything at the carnival, right? Right. But I do love in Star Trek that like, the Borg strip you of your individualism and your humanity, right? And that you always celebrate human nature in Star mm -hmm. Trek. And so right. it's human nature to take things that were important and make it accessible for kids. Like that's absolutely, what I mean, we got to we got to train the mariners of tomorrow, tomorrow. right? Like exactly. the, we got to inspire the next generation of Rutherfords to get out there. It was just so so very cool. And then the bar with the one song in the Oh, uh, the one song jukebox, baby. The one song yeah. that jukebox. That killed me. <laughs> there are moments like that where I feel like Lower Decks is going, we see you, audience. We yeah, see we you. Saw it. That's the balance. We saw it, like, we get it. Exactly. And it's like, that's where I feel like, that's where I feel like you, like kind of like lean in and go like, what's up, fellow nerds? I yeah. see you. That's like, what's up, fellow nerds is like, like we see you, but we also love the thing you love, right? So yeah, like, totally. Yes. We went to Cisco's, and we didn't make Cisco's into like a TGI Fridays. You know what right. I mean? Like yeah. Cisco's has to be like Cisco's. Right. We'll add a little, you know, catch yourself white hot sauce joke. But like, if we had changed Cisco's, I feel like that would have been saying, it would have been doing a disservice to a thing we love. But then Bozeman yeah. is like, Bozeman is awesome in first contact. It has its its yeah. huge moment. It's already a place. It's, a it's place. already a place. Yeah, it's a real place. And, and, it's already a place. And then taking our characters there, that's why I think it's a little, f we, we're allowed to have a little bit more fun with it in a sillier way, but we never would have done that to Cisco's or, or you I know. I appreciate you not turning Cisco's into a rainforest cafe. <laughs> I would have been really, been bummer. Been really bummed out. It would have been a bummer to have franchise Cisco's, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dawn, you have been captain on the Cerritos uh, for three seasons yes. uh, now, uh, and uh, your legacy as a Starfleet captain is well underway. <laughs> um, I would love to hear you talk about being this non-traditional, comedic, animated captain yes. in the Star Trek universe. Yeah. <laughs> and like, what, is that, what does that mean? First of all, just being a part of this Star Trek world is everything. I have been a Trekkie since the very first episode of Star Trek back in the day. I used oh, to risk awesome. getting whippings for watching Star Trek because we were supposed to be in bed. My brothers and I, we were so young and my mom would be at school or she'd be working and leave the woman upstairs to watch us to make sure we were in bed. So my brothers and I would put blankets over our heads and stand as close to the TV as we could <laughs> and keep the volume down so we could watch it. And we, were, we knew every line, every episode. And this is, was the know, blanket to muffle the, the sound? The blanket was to muffle the sound. Smart. But it didn't work because we could hear from upstairs the banging on the boom, 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 boom. Oh, no. Turn that TV off, I hear it. <laughs> so yeah, we would risk getting in trouble. So I'd always wanted to be some kind of alien, some kind of warrior, Klingon, you Romulan, alien somebody. Once, you? No, that's, that's my dream to be, but this was before animation. Right. I wanted to be some okay. kind of alien somebody. So when they were auditioning for Star Trek, they gave us sides, had to sign an NDA, and we were all animals or something. It didn't yeah, have- Yeah, we changed. Was, when we were, we were so afraid people would find out we were making the show, we changed yes, everything on it. they changed it. everything. So I had no idea what I was actually auditioning for. So when they were directing me for it, I said, oh, okay, yeah, all right, we're gonna, okay, great. And you go to the audition and you're done and you walk away. And next thing you know, you get a call saying you're going to be Captain Freeman on the next <laughs> Star Trek series. I, that was that was the look that I had. I was like, no, no, you're no, you're, you're kidding. Right. No. So that journey after that it has just been such a blessing to me, to all of the first time non-traditional captains yeah. that we got to see from Madge Sinclair to Cisco to I mean, all of these different people and a woman in charge. It just meant the world to me because Nichelle Nichols was my absolute hero growing up to yeah. see this African-American woman. She was a badass. She would go on away trip. She would fight with she could handle her own and she was gorgeous. Yeah. I swear, and I told them this when they first showed me 
the rendering of Captain Freeman, I said, oh my God, she looks just like Nancy Wilson. Because <laughs> oh, with the white streak yeah. in her yeah. hair, I said, and Nancy is like a goddess. She's yeah. just amazing singer. I mean, so being a part of that legacy and being this person who is capable, who is in charge, yet very human, yeah. which is what yeah. I love about our, our show. On all of the other Star Trek uh, manifestations, everybody's at their best game just about all the time yeah. or working through to their best game. Lower Decks pulls back the cover and shows us how often none of us are on our best game. We have best intentions, but the game is a little shaky from time to time. So you can see yourself and, and relate to this non-perfect person trying to do an amazing, helpful, creative, collaborative thing. And that's who Captain Freeman is. She's gonna get an ulcer, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. I will say, the way you perform Captain Freeman though, it's her show. Like she's the captain. There you go. She's she's she is a as much of a Starfleet captain as anybody ever has. There you go. You do an amazing, you. amazing job. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It is it's a it's just a great season. Thank um, you. So yeah. I'm 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 incredibly excited for the audience to see all of it. Um, and I'm grateful to both of you for making time to come and talk with, with me. I know the audience appreciates it. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for being here today. Of course. Absolutely. Anytime. Absolutely. We, we love the Ready Room. We love talking about Star Trek and about Lower Decks. And it's such an amazing time to be making these shows. While on leave, Tendi and Rutherford eat at Cisco's Creole Kitchen in New Orleans, owned by Captain Benjamin Cisco's father, Joseph, who kept what stuffed animal in the restaurant as decor? Is it A, a stuffed armadillo, B, a stuffed alligator, C, a stuffed muskrat, or D, a stuffed raccoon? Don't boldly go anywhere. Stay tuned for the answer. Last season of Star Trek Lower Decks, we got to learn firsthand from Robbie Cook, one of the series animators, how to draw Ensign Devon Attendee, and it was delightful. It was especially delightful for me when he threw in a bonus animation of me as a Starfleet officer. It we in the Ready Room love the hand-drawn style of the show and how it lends itself so well to both the comedy in the series and the Star Trek stories at play in the series. So of course we had to go back and get some more time with these talented animators. Now you might want to take some notes if you too want to draw yourself into the Star Trek universe. And if you do, I'd love to see it. Take a look. Hi, my name is Marisa Livingston. I'm the character design lead on Star Trek Lower Decks. And today I'm going to show you how to draw one of my favorite characters from the show, Dr. Ta'ana. You want me to see a doctor? I am the doctor! We're gonna get started with an underdrawing to kind of lay out our design. So just start with a big circle for her head. All right, let's just get this over with. Ah! Now I'm gonna add some smaller circles. These are going to represent her muzzle and her big eyes. The characters on Lower Decks have Pretty big eyes. Uh, they're wide and circular and expressive. Oh, sh So now that we kind of have our underdrawing very light, but we're gonna go over it darker, I'm gonna start by putting kind of like a pause symbol in between her eyes here. And these are gonna be her, her furrowed brows. She's pretty grumpy. So from here, just big straight heavy lines for her dark, heavy, expressive eyebrows. And I might even fill them in a little bit, even though we're just getting started. It just helps the character come out faster. And from here, we're gonna go into those expressive eyes. Dr. Ta'ana kind of expresses a, a cool aloofness. She's been around the block. You really showed me something today, kid. Thank you, doctor. But this isn't your patient, so get the fuck out of our way. And then we'll lay in her pupils which are slit pupils because she is a Cation. So unlike our other characters on Star Trek Lower Decks, she does not have the cute little circular pupils. Hers are unique. From here, three ridges in between her eyes. This is just kind of like the top of her little, her little muzzle where the color of her fur is different. Draw her muzzle out. Big circle about the size of her eyes. And then we'll lay in her cute little triangle nose. And from here, we'll put in her, she's got kind of a grimace. She, <laughs> she's got a little snaggle tooth in here. So we've got her face kind of in here now, and we're gonna start building out her head. Here comes the messy part. Any slight error here can result in instant death. We're gonna put two tufts of fur on each of her cheeks, just like that. 
And then she also has a cute little tuft of kind of like platinum blonde hair on her, on her orange fur. And that's going to have three tufts of fur on top. But you know, if you're drawing Dr. Tana, you know, maybe she's real frazzled and like, her hair is really all over the place. She doesn't have perfectly pointed triangle cat ears. Hers are a little more downturned to kind of suit that weariness that she exudes, that just tough, confident, but also like a lot of rage underneath. She can hiss at people, freak out, <laughs> cuss a lot. <laughs> out of this ear, she's got kind of like two semicircles. Maybe like somebody took a bite out of that ear, who knows. And then she's got really cool kind of crooked zigzag, three whiskers coming off each side. They were probably straight at one point, but now they've been through it. Godspeed, you crazy f We want to make sure that Dr. Ta'ana exudes knowledge. But with all that knowledge and experience, you get a little tired. So your shoulders droop. Her posture is a, a little grouchy, a little droopy. And we'll draw two lines straight down for the sides of her doctor coat. Her lapels are just kind of this simple triangle shape. And then she's got just the edge of a com badge sticking out underneath. You know, she's ready whenever. And then we'll draw in the lines of the super cool California class uniform, which has got these cool angles that closes over on the side. Up on the collar. And then, because she is the chief medical officer on the Cerritos, she's got three pips. At least someone around here appreciates rank. And that is how I would draw Dr. Ta'ana from Star Trek Lower Decks. And now you can too. Congratulations, you look like a f***ing scratching post. While on leave, Tandy and Rutherford eat at Cisco's Creole Kitchen in New Orleans, owned by Captain Benjamin Cisco's father, Joseph, who kept what stuffed animal in the restaurant as decor? A stuffed armadillo, a stuffed alligator, a stuffed muskrat, or a stuffed raccoon? And the answer is B, a stuffed alligator. Joseph Sisko, who passed on his culinary skills to his own son, would tease his grandson Jake as a child, telling him that the restaurant's stuffed alligator was really only in stasis and would wake up at night to guard the restaurant. Season three of Lower Decks is just beginning. Part of my job here means I have already gotten to see all of it, so I am telling you right now, this season is amazing, and I wish I could show you all of it. But that's not the way TV works. I can only show you an exclusive clip of next week's episode. So here it comes. Control room, give them a peek. Oh, hey! Hey, what's with all the new faces? We're hosting everyone that got stranded on the orbital lift while it gets repaired. That's cool. Listen, you were totally right earlier. I've been saying yes to everything today, going way outside my comfort zone, and so far Shaq says he owes me a favor, I'm not afraid of Chief Lundy anymore. It's just been a really great day. Oh, I love that for you, Boims. See, when you get rid of the plan, you leave room for good things. From now on, the new plan is say yes to everything. But that's uh, still a plan. How about just no plan? Nope. Today I am a new Boimler. A bold Boimler. And the next person who asks me to do something, I'm saying yes no matter what. Excuse me. I am Crunch. I was supposed to be on the planet by now, but the space elevator is broken. Hi, Cranch! Welcome to the Cerritos! I'm Tendi, and this is Boimler. My species has an undeniable natural urge to hunt. This delay to the planet has been weighing on me. Would either of you be willing to... <laughs> be willing to be hunted? Thank you. Maybe you should see if Dr. Ta'ana can help you out in sick bay. Wait, uh, Mr. Cranch? I'm gonna say yes to the hunted. To, to being hunted. Uh, uh, just because you said you were going to say yes to the next person who asked you to do something doesn't mean you have to do this. You can do the next one. Uh, you're right. Is what the old Boimler would have said. It would be an honor if you hunted me, sir. Let's do it. <laughs> Clearly, we're in for a very funny and very exciting season of Star Trek Lower Decks. It is so good to be back watching Star Trek with you all. 
thank you for joining me today. I'll be back in a few weeks when we get midway through the season. Tawny Newsom will be joining me right here in the Ready Room to discuss all the things that happen between now and episode five, which is to say I will have no shortage of questions. And finally, not that you need a reminder, but Star Trek Day is fast approaching on Thursday, September 8th, and you won't want to miss this year's celebration of all things Star Trek Universe. There will be plenty of ways to watch the event, both live and on demand, so mark your calendars and stay tuned to Paramount Plus for details. Until next time, I'm Will Wheaton. Live long and prosper. Thank you.